mentioned thousands of people, thousands of people in Denver today um, do not have a home. Or they are on the brink of losing their home. So we're here tonight to talk about a proposal that my administration in partnership with two members of Denver City Council, Councilwoman Robin Kanish and Councilman Albus Brooks, who could not be with us tonight. As you know, he is recuperating from surgery uh, and we want to continue to wish him well. This proposal you're going to hear about tonight to work very diligently and very assertively to reduce affordable housing in Denver has been in the works for close to two years. And Councilwoman Kanish and Councilmember Brooks um, and members, many members of my administration have worked tirelessly on this proposal. Let me just frame this for you. Denver's economy is one of the hottest economies in the nation tonight. 4,500 new people, net new people, are moving to the metro region on a monthly basis. Denver is seeing 1,000 new people move to the city 1,000 net new people move to the city on a monthly basis. What we know, as several of you have already shared with me tonight, you've experienced this. Rents are up 35% since 2010. Housing prices are rising at twice the pace of the national average. Pockets of poverty and gentrification are increasing. Federal funding, at the same time, is declining. We're at risk of losing 4,500 affordable units over the next five years as their covenants expire. We've done a lot to create affordable housing. Since I came into office, my administration has been appropriating uh, at least $3 million. We've gotten as high as $8 million for affordable housing on an annual basis. But tonight, we're going to talk about a permanent funding source where we can, over the next 10 years, aim to create some 6,000 affordable housing units. We're, at, we're looking at using a property tax and a fee on development to generate $150 million to help create those new apartments, condos, and homes in Denver. This would be the very first dedicated local source of funding for affordable housing in Denver's history. Now, we believe we've come up with a pretty balanced and very low cost way to do this. It would cost a typical homeowner about $1 a month more and create development fees ranging from 40 cents to $1.70 per square foot on all different kinds of construction. We're gonna get a little deeper into the specifics of this proposal in just a few moments. But I wanna say this, uh, before Councilwoman Robin Kanish comes up and we launch into the portion where we're going to ask for your involvement. Hey, Tim. Some people tonight and have said since we wrote out the proposal that this plan is not bold enough. Some have said it's too expensive and we can't afford it. But I want to say again, as I said last Monday, we can't afford not to do this. The risk is too high and the status quo is not an option anymore. Housing is a crisis in Denver. And we as a city, together collectively, must work together to address it. It is every city's desire to be the place that people want to live. We are that place. Indicative of the folks who are moving here, one of the top three cities in the nation for the millennials, and one of the top three destinations in the nation for baby boomers. They're coming. And many of us are choosing to stay here. And so with that said, we must determine, decide as a community how we're going to respond to the growth and the opportunities that come with it. And so with that, we're going to launch in tonight's agenda. This is not necessarily just to sit and listen. It's going to be part educating you on the proposal that's going forward, framing the issue, but also for you to, to engage. And uh, Bill Fulton will be sharing with us how you're going to do that in just a moment. So let's welcome Councilwoman Robin Kanish to the podium. Thank you, Mayor Hancock. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. How are we all tonight? 
Good. I know it's warm in here. Is it warm in here? Yes. yes. Well, this is the summer, and our DPS schools are on low energy usage, and so we are help saving your tax dollars tonight by keeping this building nice and warm. Um, both the mayor and I are a little hoarse tonight from, from all of this housing work. I guess it, it must take your voice away. This, this uh, issue is so important. Um, I want to add a few more acknowledgments of folks who came in after the mayor spoke. Uh, Lisa Flores, who's a school board member representing Northwest Denver, walked in. And thank you, Lisa and DPS, for providing North High School to us. Th let's thank North. Um, the director of the Denver Housing Authority, Ishmael Guerrero, also walked in. He operates the largest number of affordable homes in the city of Denver for us. Thank you, Ishmael. The mayor already acknowledged two of my colleagues who are here, Councilman Cashman and Councilman Espinoza, but the truth is that there is representatives from almost every council office here. They are helping at the door, they are helping with the logistics tonight, and so you have almost 13 offices represented here today, listening to your feedback and helping to make sure that we get your input. Um, I also, I'm not supposed to tell anyone this because his doctors and his wife will be really mad, but Councilman Brooks did call to check in on this proposal from the hospital today. So that's how important it is to you, uh, to him, is, is to know that this is moving forward and that you all are part of the conversation. So he sends his best. Um, I won't go into very much detail about the proposal, but I, I will say two things. One, your feedback at the last public meeting and over the last five years uh, that I've been in office helped to shape this proposal in terms of thinking about what we believe is a fair and balanced approach. You all will be the judge in giving us your feedback tonight, but that was our goal. Secondly, um, the mayor talked about the growth in Denver. There is no way to build yourself out of a housing crisis. We can't stand here and tell you that we will build our way out of this crisis, but we know one thing. If we do not build more affordable housing, it will not get better. It will not get better, and so that is why we're here tonight, to make an impact for as many families as we can. Uh, just two logistical announcements before I turn it over to the presentation. One, we have childcare available. If you have kids and you haven't yet um, or found the childcare, please go out to the hallway and they can direct you. Secondly, hay alguien aquí que necesita interpretación en español, por favor, leve tu mano. Por favor, si hay alguien. We also have sign interpretation in the front. Probably if you're hearing impaired, you can't hear me saying that, but if you see someone who appears to need interpretation, please direct them to the front. Um, with that, those of us who are on the panel will probably step into the chairs so we can watch your responses to the exercise that's coming. But I'd like to introduce Bill Fulton. He's going to be our guide for the rest of the night. He's going to uh, make sure that we move along so that we have time for all of your input. And there are four ways we're going to take your input tonight. First way, you um, have already asked questions that we've put on a frequently asked questions document. So on the screen right now is a website. If you have a device, you can go on that page right now and look at the answers to questions that were asked last time. You can go right there. You can also follow along to the presentation there. So we will also ask see if there's additional questions. We will not have time to take everybody's question tonight. There are too many of you. But we will take a few questions. We will also be asking for you to do polling. If you do not have a clicker, please raise your hand. If everyone, hopefully everyone has one. So uh, team, if we can get the extra clickers into the hands of folks, keep your hand up until someone comes to you. Thank you. We will also have breakout groups. So if you're looking for the chance for a more intimate dialogue where you get to talk directly to the city folks who have been a part of shaping this proposal, that will happen during the breakout. We don't have time to do an open mic with this many individuals, but there will be time for that breakout discussion. The last half hour, 45 minutes, is set aside for that group discussion. So we will get your, your clicker results, your polling, we will get your questions on note cards. We will get your input during the breakout. So that is our number one goal. There are many ways to give your input tonight. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill Fulton, and thank you again for coming. Thanks so much, Councilwoman Kanish. Uh, good evening, my name is Bill Fulton. I uh, work with the Civic Canopy. We're a nonprofit here in Denver that helps the many work as one for the good of all. So it's a delight to be in your company tonight on this important issue around affordable housing. 
Uh, I, I just want to underscore what has been said already that the most important thing is that we get your input. So if you're having a hard time seeing the screens, uh, we do have some copies of the, of the material uh, that you can uh, get a hard copy and read along with. Uh, Will, who is in the back there, who's running around feverishly with the clickers, has hard copies if anyone needs that in order to follow along. Just put your, okay, great. There's a couple of hands here, Will. Great. All right, well, let's begin with some introductory uh, questions just to get you familiar with your clicking device. I'm going to actually have to step forward. Great. So hopefully everybody's got their clicking device. We'll just do a kind of a quick practice slide to get used to your uh, clickers. And if those of you up front want to follow along, if you guys want to be able to see the results here. The polls are open now. It's a softball question to start. What is your favorite summer Olympic sport? We're going to start nice and easy on this. The polls are open. This gives us a chance to see the total number of folks that will be voting. So very important for you to weigh in. As you press your clicker, you can't mo vote more than once, but if you change your mind, it will register the last vote you press. So if you or your spouse changes your mind, it'll register that last vote. So everybody press one more time just to make sure we've got everybody's votes in. I think we've got more than 128 people here, so we'll close the polls in three, two, and one. A strong swimming crowd tonight. Not sure what that reflects, but great. So you get the idea how the clickers work. Okay, the questions get a little bit more in depth from here. Next slide, Andrew. Okay, which of the best describes you and why you are here participating today? Would you say that you're A, a member of a registered neighborhood association, a registered or restricted affordable housing or in need of it, advocate, organizer, activist, Developer or other business representative, service provider, interested community member, or other. Just press the letter that corresponds with your role. We've got a number of clicker slides we're going through tonight, so voting quickly is a benefit. What's that? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. We'll close in three, two, and one. Great, and for the benefit of the group up here, the top vote, 29% uh, is an advocate, organizer, activist. Uh, next, it looks like an uh, interested community member, and then a close tie between residents of a, a restricted affordable housing and a member of registered neighbor associations. Great. Okay. It tells us a little about who's in the room, and what part of the city do you live in or work in if you are not a resident? What part of the city do you live in or work in? Far, so that would be East Denver if it's closer in. That would be uh, far northeast is Montbello Green Valley Ranch. If you're in Global or Swansea, you'd be closer in in East Denver. And these are rough approximations. Do the best you can with where you feel you're from. We're just trying to get a sense of who's here from around the city. We'll close in three, two, and one. So a nice mix. Looks like downtown central uh, is 27%, uh, northwest 23%, and uh, East Denver with 17% of the top three vote catchers. But a good representation across the city. That's excellent. Okay, the next question. Uh, were you at the previous meeting that we had back in April at East High School? Yes, no, or I don't know. <laughs> Just wanted to have an option for everyone. We'll close in three, two, and one. All right. So let's hope you remember this meeting, those of you that didn't remember if you were the last one. 77% of you said no. So we have a uh, welcome to those that are here for the first time. Thanks for coming back, those who were at the first one. Next question. Uh, please describe your housing today. It's a little bit smaller type, so I'll read them. A, I own my own home. B, I rent a house or duplex. C, I rent an apartment. D, I live in a shelter or subsidized housing. 
E, I am staying in another person's home because I'm a f I can't afford my own. F, I, am, I do not have a home. And G, other. Which one best fits your housing situation now? And we'll close in three, two, and one. About 47% own their own home, 21% rent an apartment, 16% rent a house or duplex. And then a smattering of the other categories, everything represented. Okay, next question. Please describe your level of housing security today. A, homeless. B, in housing that has a restricted price to keep it affordable. C, in housing that is affordable today but not restricted, so prices could rise. D, stable. I can afford my housing at my current income without much worry. E, comfortable. I don't worry about the price of housing. And F, not sure. Bless you. Great, and we'll close. Housing that is uh, in housing that is affordable today, but restricted, so prices could rise, is one possibility. Or F could be not sure if you're in between those categories. Hard to get every situation on there. We'll close in three, two, and one. Uh, looks like a range from stable to uh, affordable today, but could rise is the predominant 39% in stable, 31% it could rise, and some in each category. All right, next question. So how about your concerns? And again, this is your top concerns. You might have a number of them, but when you think about housing in Denver, my biggest concern is A, for myself right now, B, for myself in the future, C, for my young adult children, D, for my aging or elderly parents, E, for others in the community, F, other, or G, I don't have a concern about housing. When you think about your biggest concern, which best captures it. And we'll close in three, two, and one. So it looks like for yourselves, for yourself in the future, and for children are the top, oh no, excuse me, for others in the community, 52%, uh, and then uh, self and self in the future. Next question. Choose your three. Now, this is a, uh, when you get to vote three times on this one. It's your, uh, in order of preference. Choose your top three in order of preference. So you get three votes. Your top preference is the one you press first. Second preference is the one you press second. Third preference is the vote, one you vote press third. Your biggest concerns about housing affordability in my community are, A, the negative impacts on low-income families who can't find housing or pay too much. B, the loss of economic diversity in Denver. C, the inability to attract or keep businesses because they can't find workers. D, seniors struggling to age in Denver. E, young people not being able to stay in Denver or return after higher education, or F, other. So your top three priorities, the first one you press is your most important priority, second one you press is your second most, and third one you press is your third most important. When you think about your concerns about housing, Oh, uh, looking for more clickers in the back? Great, thanks, Will. Okay, we'll close in three, two, and one. So top one there is 34%, negative impacts on low-income families who can't afford or find housing. Second is loss of economic uh, diversity in Denver. And third looks like a senior struggling to age in Denver. All right, next question. Oh, it's the total number of votes, not the total number of uh, individual preferences. He was asking what's the total number. So it's the same number of voters on that. So the last one, challenge of affordable housing for Denver residents is very serious. Do you A, strongly disagree, B, disagree, C, somewhat disagree, D, are you neutral, 
E somewhat agree, F agree, or G strongly agree. When you think about this question that the challenge of affordable housing for Denver residents is very serious. In other words, how serious is this issue? If it's very serious to you, you'd press G. If it's not serious at all, you'd press A, and the whole continuum in between. So we'll close in three, two, and one. 72% uh, strongly agree, 11% agree. Strong issue. And 7% uh, strongly disagree, I should note on there. Next question, I think this is our last one. So, sorry, you can't read it on the top of there. It, how important is to you that the city of Denver dedicate new local funding to address the challenge of affordable housing? How important it to you is this, that the city of Denver dedicate new local funding to address the challenge of affordable housing? Critical, important, somewhat important, neutral, somewhat not important, not important, or not important at all. Great, so th I think this is just in general, the importance of the issue of dedicating any money at any level. No, yeah, great. Oh, great, that, that question, yeah, what do we, yeah, we'll get to the definition of affordable housing in the presentation. 120 is the kind of broad range of it, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the, diff the different levels. About, about $80,000 a year in annual income. At that, or below, up to that point. So how critical is it to, that the city address new and local funding to address that challenge? Again, we'll talk about some of the details, but in general, closing in three, two, and one. 71% say critical, 19% say important, and about 2% for the rest of the categories. Last one, and your feelings about this statement. It is important for all of Denver, businesses and residents to contribute to creating more affordable housing. Do you strongly disagree? B, disagree. C, somewhat disagree. D, are you neutral? E, somewhat agree. F, agree. Or G, strongly agree. For businesses and residents to contribute towards the funding of affordable housing. And we'll close in three, two, and one. Looks like 44% strongly agree, 24% agree, 11% uh, strongly disagree, and 7% st somewhat disagree. Okay, I think that's all of our opening questions. Thanks for bearing with it. Obviously, these categories are not always, not always perfect. Uh, there's not always the exact answer you want, but we're trying to get a general feeling of your perceptions on many of these issues. I believe our next slide is to turn it over to Laura. Great, so I want to introduce Laura Brzezinski from the Office of Economic Development to walk us through some of the background information for the rest of the evening. Laura? Thanks so much, Bill. All right, can folks hear me again? Great, okay, so I'm Laura Brzezinski with Denver's Office of Economic Development. I'm gonna provide some background on their proposal before we do a second set of questions to, to hear your reactions and your feedback on the details of the proposal. Before I get into that, I just wanna uh, recognize that we have another elected official that's joined us. Welcome, Councilman New from Council District 10. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, so I think we have a, the uh, graph up here, uh, but I think the mayor did a, a really great job of of introducing us to this um, idea of how housing prices have increased over the last several years and have really um, created this severe need for affordable housing here. And I think your answers recognize that as well. Um, so we've seen a, a significant jump in the price of both homes and apartments over the last several years. That's the upswing that you see here. Over the same time period, we've seen a significant decrease in the federal resources that 
that the city has to invest directly into the production and preservation of affordable housing. That's the other component of this chart. So you can see we have an increasing need next to a decreasing amount of resources to help address that need. Um, so with this scenario, um, this is now more than ever a time for us as this, at the city to be thinking about investment into affordable housing at the local level. Um, we're going to take some questions later, um, but I, I'm going to move on to the next slide. But um, the, this trend is over the last eight, eight years, those have climbed significantly. Um, so this next slide here has a few examples. Um, so the question about income level, what are we talking about when we mean um, area median income, which is a metric that's used by the city, um, determined by, by HUD at a federal level um, in terms of income level and how we think about this. So the median income in Denver is about $80,000. That's for a family of four. So these are a couple examples of what kind of in income earner um, that family would have. So at 100% area median income, an example of an earner in that family might be a social worker. Um, and can you, see, you can see a number of these other examples here for what at 30%, 60%, 80%, and 120% AMI might have. So I think the mayor spoke um, in, in detail to some of the uh, process behind how we got to the proposal we're sharing with you tonight. Um, but it's more than a year in the making in terms of the city's research and vetting of potential sources to be used for a dedicated fund for affordable housing. Um, and that was first announced, the goal of creating this fund at the mayor's uh, inaugural speech last summer in July. Um, so the, the proposal that we're going to see tonight in more detail um, was informed by two Two economic nexus study, uh, two economic studies, including a nexus study, uh, significant financial modeling by the city, and a large amount of stakeholder and public input. Uh, over the last year, we've met consistently with stakeholder groups, generated a number of neighborhood and mainstream media, and held a public meeting that some of you at least attended at East High School in April. So a quick uh, overview before we get into the details of each component of the proposal. So uh, we believe based on our modeling that we would generate an estimated $155 million over the first 10 years. Again, that's to build about 6,000, build and preserve about 6,000 affordable housing units with a split half from a development fee and half from a property tax. Uh, so we believe that this proposal creates a fair and balanced approach um, and to generating revenue, and it has all of the residents of the community, including businesses, including residents, to address this community issue. Um, and it relies on the stability of property tax in addition to allowing for some um, capturing of growth along with the market during a development upcycle. Um, so if, if there is anyone in the, um, in the audience that does have a question and you want to make sure that we address it during the next section, if you want to raise your hand, we do have comment cards for you to be able to ask that question for the next segment of this agenda. Um, so just wanted to share a visual representation for those who might um, absorb information better this way. Um, the visual representation shows you these two uh, development fee and property tax coming into the fund to build and preserve about 6,000 housing units over 10 years. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more into uses here in a moment, but that would be up to 100% 120% of AMI, which as you can see here is about $96,000. So the first area median income is what that stands for. Um, so the first component that we'll talk about um, is that development fee. Um, so just a little bit more background on that. It's a one-time fee that would be charged on new commercial and residential development. Um, and it helps the city to meet the demands of new affordable housing needed because of the jobs that are created by new commercial and residential development. Um, so these types of fees are common in many of our other metro area jurisdictions, including Boulder that uses a similar fee on commercial development to help create affordable housing. Uh, 
Um, so a little bit of background on what the fees are that we're proposing. Uh, the mayor mentioned a little bit um, earlier in his introductory remarks, but we are proposing four categories of development fee on new commercial and residential development. On the residential side, there would be a fee on new single family and duplex development, and that would be 60 cents per square foot. On the residential side, on the multifamily, it would be a per, sque per square foot fee of $1.50. On the commercial side, you would have two categories of fee, one new fee for hotel, office, and retail development at $1.70 per square foot, and then the last category is for industrial and agricultural development that would have a per square foot fee of 40 cents. So that captures all of the development across the city of Denver, both on the residential and the commercial side under that structure. Um, so just to give you, to put those numbers into a little bit of context, um, for a new single family home at about 2,500 square feet, that would equate to about $1,500. Uh, for a new commercial project, um, think for a 25,000 square foot development, think about a, a Walgreens or a bank in terms of that size, at 25,000 square feet and a dollar 70 per square foot, that would equate to about $42,500. Um, and so we've given you a little bit of a visual representation here, but those fees um, on a per square foot basis equate to less than 1% of the total development cost. So it's a relatively low impact on the feasibility of our projects. So the second component of this proposal um, is the property tax. Um, as many of you will remember, uh, voters approved a measure in 2012 to remove the city from Tabor limits. It was called 2A. And 2A gave the city permission to keep up to 6.22 property tax mills annually that we were not previously collecting. Uh, we've not been activating all of those mills that go voters gave us approval to use in 2012. So the proposal here is that we would dedicate one half of a mill in the first year to help fund affordable housing. Um, so that translates to about $6.5 million over 10 years. Uh, excuse me, that, ex that equates to about $6.5 million annually to be contributed towards affordable housing um, with, with both commercial and residential payers. Um, so this amount would grow gradually over time as values change. Um, so to give you a sense of what that impact would look like on residential and commercial property taxpayers, for a homeowner, as the mayor mentioned earlier, the proposed half mill would have an impact of about $12 on a median home priced at $300,000. So that's about $1 a month in increase for this. Um, for a per commercial property taxpayer, that would equate to about $145 for every $1 million in commercial value. So the next uh, chart gives you a sense of what that revenue would have looked like if we used that property tax and fee over the last 10 years. What I think is important for you to notice with this is that the property tax is a stable and gradually growing revenue source to be used for affordable housing. The development impact fee, um, on the other hand, would bring in more revenue during an economic boom and less revenue when there's less development happening on the market. So it's not a consistent amount each year from the development fee that would vary year to year by the market. So you can see over the last 10 years, that dip down in the 2007 and eight years, that impact fee would have, uh, development fee, excuse me, would have brought in less revenue. So how would the funds be used? Um, the funds would be used to create, preserve, and rehabilitate affordable housing units across Denver. Um, and they would be used for rental housing up to 80% AMI, um, which is about $64,000 uh, for a family of four again. Um, it would be used for for sale, to create and preserve for sale housing up to 100% of the AMI, which is about $80,000 for a family of four. And a portion of the funds could also be used for homeownership assistance. This includes down payment assistance, mortgage assistance, um, strategies that might help keep homeowners in their homes um, that would be uh, available up to 120% AMI. So that's about $96,000 for a family of four. 
So to help us make decisions year to year on how those funds would be spent within those um, or underneath those different um, income limits, we would create a new uh, mayor's housing advisory committee made up of 20 representatives from a diverse set of perspectives. Um, the body would recommend goals and policies for the fund, uh, such as income ranges to be spent uh, with resources and programs, uh, including innovative programs such as land banking. Uh, the body would also review semi-annual and performance reports on the fund as investments are made into affordable housing. So the last slide we have here uh, before we get some of your feedback is on our tentative schedule uh, moving forward into August. So uh, we, we look forward to getting your feedback over the next few minutes and throughout the evening tonight. Um, and we plan to have a presentation at City Council's Safety Committee on Wednesday, August 2nd. There will be public comment available at that meeting, 15 minutes of public comment. Um, and after that, we look to uh, move forward with the official council process later in August. Great, so I will turn it back over to Bill for our second set of questions. Thanks, Laura. I'll invite our panel up to help answer some of the questions. Are you guys? Uh, and while uh, we're trying to sort through all the questions that uh, people gave, we're trying to kind of categorize them, put them in themes. We may not have a chance to answer all of them, uh, tonight, but we certainly wanted to give a, uh, a good stab. So if you've filled out a question and ha want to have that as a part of the discussion, please put your hand up and we'll come around and grab that. Reminder, oh, I'm not yeah. Rem reminder that if you go to denvergov.org slash housing, there is a frequently asked questions list under the revenue tab. So if you go to denvergov.org slash housing and then on the right hand side, there is permanent revenue you can um, click on the frequently asked questions and get answers to a lot of the questions we may not have time to answer in our big group tonight. Great, and then I'm assuming, Councilwoman, that uh, ones we don't have time for will also keep getting added to that list. So if we don't, if you don't hear your question answered tonight, please check back there. Um, while we're sorting through the questions, why don't we just take a minute to have the panel introduce themselves so people know the roles that you, got, you all play and, and some of the background that you bring. So Brendan, do you mind? Sure. Brendan Hanlon. I am the Chief Financial Officer for the City and County of Denver. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Laura Brzezinski with Denver's Office of Economic Development. I'm Doug Selby with the Office of Economic Development. Great. All right. Um, and it looks like the way we're, uh, uh, Evan has kind of sorted through these, passed them to folks that have the kind of uh, immediate response and some of the background that might be useful to answer those questions. So we'll just kind of work our way down the panel and back uh, and get a chance to answer some of those questions. Should we start with you, Councilwoman Kanisha? Sure. My first question is how much money is the city putting into permanent supportive housing? Permanent supportive housing is the word or the term we use to describe housing for individuals are homeless. And the idea is that we first put them into housing and then we get them the services they need to stabilize their lives and help to have more opportunity going forward. That's the supportive service part. Denver has uh, really already invested in 250 new permanently supportive affordable homes for formerly homeless individuals through a uh, innovative tool the mayor launched which helps to pay for those services by the savings from those individuals not spending the night in jail or in hospitals. So that savings is helping to pay for those services. We just gave a new investment to uh, another affordable housing project for homeless individuals that will serve women uh, related to the Dolores project. And there is another 50 units coming online from St. Francis. All of those projects received funding from the city and county of Denver. So about five new supportive housing projects over the course of three or so years, it's an important goal to continue to fund that kind of housing out of this fund. It is a priority and one that has been assumed to be part of the uses of this fund. Should we move down to Mr. Mayor? Sure. The question I have uh, is a good one and a timely one. How will these new developments affect the displacement and the retention of current residents while maintaining the cultural integrity of the community? Uh, First and foremost, it doesn't, and we firmly believe this in the city, have to be either or. In terms of 
bringing the necessary amenities and services and developments to a community that are designed to leverage employment opportunities and and new and and uh, new opportunities for everyone who live in the community or maintaining um, the the current resident base and cultural identity of a community. We believe we can do both. Uh, the city has just completed a gentrification study that was steep in, in recommendations on how we can avoid uh, wholesale displacement uh, of a community like uh, Globeville or Ilaria Swansea uh, as we go in and make new infrastructure and amenity improvements in the community. We're moving already ahead uh, with some of these efforts to design to to help individuals who want to stay in the community, stay in communities, create opportunities around employment, uh, job development, as well as uh, business development um, for the individuals that are, are living in, in the communities. But we also believe that as we bring these developments to the community that the people who should benefit first and foremost are the folks who live there in terms of the jobs uh, and the opportunities that come along with it. So the city's already leaning in to try to avoid and to uh, discourage displacement of individuals who are living in communities that we're moving in to make uh, significant investments with new developments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, um, Yes, I'm so sorry. We've, we've got so many questions lined up. We'll try to take the ones that we have here, and I apologize that we won't have time for all questions. I do you want to uh, recognize Councilwoman Sussman, who uh, is here from Council District 5 in East Denver? Thanks so much for joining us, Councilwoman. We're going to try to do a lightning round question, so uh, if we can keep our responses under a minute or two, we'll try to take as many questions as we can. To, to the next, you. All right. Lightning round. That's, that's <laughs> kind of tough. Um, my question uh, first is a uh, high percentage of Denver rental households earn less than 35000 annually, but if the AMI, the area median income, is 80%, I think we're talking about that restriction we just mentioned in the slides, uh, then they wouldn't qualify. Um, where would they go if 30% AMI properties are at capacity. Actually, they would qualify in the 80% uh, properties. Whenever we issue a percentage of AMI, it's an up to. That's a ceiling. That is not a floor. And that is not at exactly that 80%. An 80% unit can be rented from somebody that's 30% with a voucher. That's 40%, 50%, 60%. They would not be charged in any of the units that the OED has participated financially in. They would not be charged more than 30% of their income. So all the units, um, they have an up to. In that I say that, there is a recognition that there is not enough units out there available at these low AMI levels. And so the OED is continuing with its uh, voucher assistance programs that we fund through partners. And we are releasing ANOFA again late this summer. And we will have the voucher assistance program as part of that ANOFA too. This will provide for more vouchers for folks to find units that they can rent. How many, How many vouchers? Uh, approximately, I mean, we'll probably release about $600,000 worth, um, depending on the household or the person. Um, if it's a single person that was renting, that would be more leveraged, but this should handle about 35 households. Thanks, Ted. All right. For the whole one. year. Yeah. <laughs> the rent's expensive on the, um, on the family households. We don't control that rental market. Yeah, so just, I just want to make one comment. We're trying to move through as many questions. We Obviously, these are deep feelings. We could talk about each one of these questions for a long time. We're trying to get a, an overview for people to have a good sense of their perspective. Because in a moment, we're going to ask you your opinion about this basic approach. So let's go ahead, Laura. Take the next question. Sure. Hope you can hear me here. So my question is related to what other cities have a property tax as part of how they fund affordable housing. So property taxes are common in other cities to, in other major cities to fund affordable housing. A good example is Seattle that has a bond that generates about $20 million per year from a property tax. Another example is Austin. They generate about $15 million per year from a property tax, similar to what we've discussed here. 
year. I will just take a moment to also acknowledge that the um, development fee is a common best practice in a lot of our peer cities as well. Seattle also has a fee like this that they charge on commercial development. Boston, Massachusetts is another example that has a fee like this on commercial development and a number of other um, West Coast cities and East Coast cities that have a development fee like this. So both of the proposed sources are best practices in other cities. Thanks, Laura. And, and Brendan? Great. Uh, so uh, the question was, is it true that, the, that affordable housing is built into the, sorry, into the budget at $7 million uh, per year that would be removed from the budget. So currently in the 2016 budget, $8 million was used to fund affordable housing. It was a transfer into our, our current affordable housing program. The, the proposal would be to replace that methodology with a permanent fund, so that way that fund and this transfer of, um, I'm sorry, not transfer, the, the property tax and linkage fee would not have to compete within the general fund. That would be programmed in the budget. Sorry. That was a one time fee. That would be programmed in the annual budget process. Just uh, another reminder we also have the time for the breakout sections afterwards. We can pick up some of these conversations in more depth. Let's get another round as we go. I have a very quick one. Why will, when will the city consider rent caps or rent control? Rent control is prohibited by a state statute in the state of Colorado. The city of Denver cannot legally limit the price of rent in the market unless we invest our dollars. If we invest our dollars, we can limit affordability for 20, 30, 40. We've even limited it for 60 years. That's partially why this fund is such an important tool because we cannot limit the rent under state law. Two, two quick ones. One of the question is why not increase the marijuana tax and use any surpluses um, to help with housing? You know, we looked at a lot of a variety of different um, um, sources of revenue to support permanent housing. When you think about how we want to do permanent housing, with the term permanent being the, the operative, you need stable, consistent source. Marijuana taxation uh, or revenue uh, is not really considered a stable, consistent source that you can bank on. Uh, not with regards to the levels. You always have the revenue, but you won't have the levels necessary to, to support permanent affordable housing and development every year. Uh, property taxes uh, is probably your most secure, stable source that we can invest in or use uh, for this. And let me just say, no decision with regards to the dollars that we are investing from general fund today uh, which, by the way, includes marijuana revenue, um, has been made with regards to this proposal. We may very well make the decision to continue to add re general fund dollars to the pool of dollars for permanent housing. Um, it, it, a lot of it will dictate how fast we're moving, how, how quickly we're able to deploy, and in partnership with the governance committee that will be set up. One of the last questions that I have here is, was really about um, the makeup of this room and whether or not there's good representation for those who need um, subsidized housing. Um, this meeting was widely publicized. We really honor those who show up. You are participating. We also acknowledge the fact the majority of the room, by your own vote, are folks who um, are homeowners, which is not necessarily a contradiction of what we're trying to do here. One, you will be impacted by the implement implementation of a new property tax, and two, you care about your city. And if we are in a housing crisis, I'm, I'm glad you showed up to be a part of the conversation because it is important to you, important to all of us who own property to make sure that people have safe, decent, affordable housing in Denver. We're gonna continue to do what we can to include all the voices in the city on this issue. We send it out wide and far on social media. We try to hit a lot of network of folks who are working with those who might be ch uh, challenged or burdened with rents and uh, mortgages at this time. And so as you come in the room, we all bring the consciousness of the community with us to try to address the issue. But we'll continue to work hard to make sure we include people. And those of us who are here, let's make sure that we share with our neighbors, friends, and family members the importance of tuning in on this issue. Let's hear. These are your questions. Yeah, these are your questions. And again, we'll have a, a chance in the breakouts for smaller groups. All right, next question, Doug. Is this ISO Okay. 
It sounds like a, a detailed question, well worth picking up. We're trying to get to the questions that people have submitted. Let's go. Yeah. We will have inner. So yeah, yeah. the question I got in front of me is define. Affordable. It's not. Wait, let me just say, folks. I think we all understand what's going on. We've got more questions than we have time for. Some folks wrote them down as we ask. We're responding to them. Some folks are calling them out. We understand the. It's not censoring. It's preserving the voice of those that wrote these questions down. So please do stay around for the small group breakouts. We'd love to answer all of them. It's not a lack of interest in that. It's just that everybody's time is precious here and we're trying to get through this section so we can get your feedback on the vote. So I'm gonna, he's choosing ones that can be answered as best we can. All of these will be captured and answered on the FAQ. We've got to work together. Doug, I'm gonna ask you to press on here. Okay. So this says, define affordable. It is too broad with reference to annual income for families. Broadly defined affordable means that you're not paying more than 30% of your gross income for your housing. So if you're making $10,000 a year, you're not paying more than $3,000 a year for your housing. Thanks, Doug. That's the definition. Laura, let's take the next question. Sure, so my next question um, is whether there is evidence available to demonstrate that the proposed fee wouldn't have a chilling effect on new commercial and residential development. Um, so it wouldn't negatively impact the market. And so I think this is a good question. We were very conscious of that thought as we went through this process. As we um, did the economic study that helped us to determine what the legally justified fee would be, our fees are far lower than what the legally justified fee would be. We also did a parallel, uh, what's called a feasibility analysis, where we modeled prototypical developments in, in the city of Denver, a, a model of what the cost would be to build, to build a new single family home or a five story rental or a 12 story office. And we plugged these proposed fees into that model development, that model pro forma to understand what the impact was and what a range of different fees would have an impact on. Um, and so what we found from that study is that the, the proposed fees that we have here make less than 1% of an impact on the return of developers who create this product. So we were very conscious of that, and we do not believe that it will have a significant impact on a developer's pro forma. Are the developers going to be able to pass it through right for the purchaser? All right. Uh, any last questions, Doug? We'll take just a couple more, then we'll break. I was asked, oh, sorry. The mic is going on and off. I was asked about the inclusionary housing ordinance. It currently requires four sale developments of 30 units or more to include 10% of their homes as affordable. What that will happen to that proposal? The inclusionary housing ordinance has been in existence for about 13 years, and during that time, it has built either on site or through buyout dollars about 600 units of affordable homes for sale and rental. We are going to replace the inclusionary housing ordinance with this development fee. The development fee is estimated to generate more than 3,000 affordable homes. So we will be swapping out a policy that generated 600 homes over 13 years with one that will generate more than 3,000 over 10 years. So that is the, the ultimate, the inclusionary housing ordinance will continue to govern any projects that have agreements. So in this neighborhood, St. Anthony's has an agreement under the inclusionary housing ordinance. It will have to fulfill it, as will other developments across the city that have entered into agreements. Those agreements will continue. There are a lot of questions regarding preservation, and let me just, uh, for example, one asks, uh, it's, I, we think it's equally important uh, to effectively managing, manage housing we already have to stay affordable, and absolutely, preservation of the current stock is very important, and that's why it's part of this strategy going forward, and I will applaud City Council for addressing that issue even before this bill came forward and making sure that retention was a part of it through some ordinances that passed uh, uh, just last year. Um, the other one was, um, why is the goal only 15 million? That was what I addressed earlier. Some people say it's not bold enough. Some will say it's too expensive. Uh, and I and we keep hearing this, if there are 80,000 units are needed, um, why only raise 15 million per year? The, the, the issue that we're, the challenge that we're facing is that 87,000 households are rent or mortgage burdened uh, in the city of Denver. Um, 
building more housing is, not, is only one part of the equation that we have to also address in Denver and our metro region. Unfortunately, for the past decade and a half, we've also suffered from the stagnation of wages in, in our, our metro region and indeed across the nation. Um, and that's why you heard me last Monday call for it and many other mayors are calling for a change in policy throughout our states, an increase in minimum wage, but also to the private sector, to all of us who are employers to say, it's time to start paying the employees of this nation so they can afford decent housing. And so that's what this is. So the point I'm making is that this is a much it's a much broader approach that we have to take. We will never be able to, as someone, I think Councilwoman Kanish made a very clear, build our way out of this crisis. It's also about making sure people are gainfully employed, properly trained, and compete in today's economy with proper wages. Thank you, Mayor. We can't, we already pay uh, above minimum wage and prevailing wage for appropriate salaries. State law, state law prohibits Denver from having a unique minimum wage just for the city. So state law prohibits cities from having their own minimum wage in the state of Colorado. So we could not raise wages in the city and county of Denver. We have to follow the state minimum wage. And we also have an ordinance in terms of our salaries are set by survey, so we remain competitive uh, for every job classification in city and county of Denver. For our employees. I think we're going to move on. So we're expanding beyond that original question. Last two questions, and we'll uh, take your clicker input. Um, how will the proposal affect areas such as Stapleton that have their own affordable housing programs? And Councilwoman <coughs> Kanich, I think you addressed this pro uh, question before in an earlier meeting. In so much that there's been an agreement with the city that uh, an area has already demonstrated its commitment to the affordability and has met that affordable number, um, they would not be uh, double dipping into this new fund um, for their affordability on the programs. So in so much that there are areas such as Stapleton that have met that or that are meeting it under a prior agreement, those would not be um, altered by the enactment of this fund. One last question, Laura. Sure. Um, I might try and sneak in too because they're good. Um, but I have a question around whether uh, the proposed funds could be used to uh, support community land trusts. Um, and just wanted to address the fact that our federal resources that we have right now, and you saw that graph that was, it was dwindling in terms of our federal resources, are far more restrictive in terms of how those can be used, both in the AMI level, but also into the type of investment that federal dollars can be used. Part of the benefit of having a local fund, in addition to creating more resources that help us build more affordable housing, is that we can use it more creatively to address our housing needs since it doesn't have the same restrictions that our federal housing funds do. So yes, these types of funds could be used for creative solutions like community land banking and others. On the second question that I just wanted to address um, quickly is whether the proposed fee would apply to scrape offs, remodels, lot splittings and that type of development. So yes, the fee would apply to a scrape off if there was a, a um, just to give a little bit of context on that, if there was a home that was perhaps older, smaller, that was acquired and um, demolished and in its place a larger, more expensive home was put in its place, uh, the fee would apply to that new development. The fee would not apply to remodel of a home unless there was new square footage added. So if you're just rehabilitating a kitchen or um, not expanding the footprint of a home, that fee would not apply. So just wanted to make sure we got, that was a really good question, wanted to make sure we got that answered. Thanks so much, panel. Yeah, there he goes. I'll touch this. Uh, thanks to our panel for those questions. Thank you all for your great questions, and thanks for your patience. We know that there's no way to answer all of them tonight. Clearly, uh, there's much more to talk about. Just to encourage you again to stay for the small breakout section, uh, our small group breakout section at the end. Uh, we know some folks have come in since we did the first round of clickers. Would you raise your hand if you don't have a little clicker device and we will make sure one of the team runs around to get you one. Um, great, so we've got some volunteers. So keep your hands up until, uh, and if you still have other questions, we can still capture those for future FAQs uh, and you can take them with you to your, 
uh, to your breakout section. All right, so hopefully you have a chance, you've had a chance to hear what's on the table, the proposal that the city's been working on and refining thanks to community input. Uh, we wanted to uh, move through these questions, but we also wanted to save time for your input on this important policy decision. So hopefully your clickers are ready again, and we'll walk through your uh, feedback for the city uh, as you consider these issues. Clickers? Great, so sorry we didn't get that fixed. Good. All right, so we're gonna back up and restart. Let's see, so are we ready, Andrew? Okay, so, uh, oops, yeah, your head's right in the middle. Okay, so the polls are open here. Uh, I'll just step around so I can read. All right, so the residential fee of 60 cents per square foot for single family homes and a dollar fifty per square foot for apartments seems A, too low, we should be charging more, B, just right, C, too high, we should be charging less, D, I oppose charging a development fee at all, and E, I don't know or no opinion. Just quick math estimate. A 1,500 square foot, I'm sorry, yes, a 2,500 square foot home, which is the average size of a new home being built in Denver, 2,500 square feet, would pay $1,500. Thanks so much, Councilwoman. That's the 60 cents. Uh, double that uh, for apartments. Yeah, I think we had that on that previous slide. Sorry, that was, we had to separate it so you could see this. So good questions. Uh, at that rate, what's your feeling about the appropriateness of that fee? Is it too low, too high, or just right? I think that's, how would it affect education? Maybe a good follow-up question for the, the um, breakout group. Yeah, yeah. Yep. We're gonna close in three, two, oh. These are developers, that's a good question, thank you. Uh, this fee is paid by developers as they build uh, residential uh, homes and apartments. So, 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 uh, <laughs> these, these fees are um, similar to fees in cities like Sacramento and San Jose. Other than that, they are um, much lower than many other cities. Boulder is in the $9 range. Um, West Coast and East Coast cities can be in the teens. So these are on the low end, um, similar to San Diego, San Diego and Sacramento. So if that changes your vote, uh, before we close it, go ahead and press it again. These fees paid by developers on residential uh, property of either houses or apartments, are they too low, just right, too high, or do you oppose charging them at all? And we'll close in three, two, and one. So about 51% say they're too low, we should be charging more, 19% say just right, 12 too high, eight oppose them at all, and 9% not really sure. Okay. All right, so the commercial fees. The city's proposed commercial development fees of 40 cents per square foot for industrial development, and $1.75 per square foot for hotel, office, retail, and other. For example, a 25,000 square foot office it would be $425,000. Again, these are paid by the developers. Two, oh. Oh, shoot. 
it should be a dollar seventy per square foot for hotel office retail, and it's forty two thousand five hundred dollars is the average cost. So I think we had some typos in translation, and I apologize for those. We I think it will probably be corrected on the next slide where your voting is. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that is not Councilwoman Kanishi. That is the translation for us. It's forty two five. Forty two five. So the commercial, let's see, I'll read it over here. Commercial fees of 40 cents per square foot for industrial development and $1.70, $1.70 per square foot for hotel, office, retail, and others seems A, too low, we should be charging more, B, just right, C, too high, we should be charging less, D, I oppose charging developers fees at all, and E, I don't know or no opinion. Comparison with other cities, same basic comparison. We kind of come out in the same spot. So again, this is 40 cents and a dollar 70 per square foot, which would be about 42.5. Is where do you think that stacks? Too low, just right, too high. And we'll close the polls in three, two, and one. About 61% say that's too low, we should be charging more. 21% say it's just right, 10% too high, and 6% uh, say I don't know. All right, next question. So the city has proposed starting with an estimated 6.5 million in funding from the property tax in the first year. This would likely represent just under a half of the total fund over the course of 10 years. So 6.5 million in the first year, this would be about half of the course over the 10 years. So we're going to ask you what you think about this one next. So an estimated 6.5 million of the housing fund coming from property taxes seems A, too low, we should be getting, dedicating more property tax, B, just right, C, too high, more should come from the development fee, D, I don't like either of these sources, I would prefer a different source, E, we shouldn't be using any city funds to pay for housing, or F, I don't know, or no question. They're about the same. There's. Uh, uh, it's not an intention to deflect the weather. Thanks for the feedback. So, yeah, we will. Uh, the the primary purpose here is where's this fee right? Do you want a different combination? And I think all the slides get at that. We'll close. In three, two, and one. So this one, uh, about 36% say it's too low. We should be dedicating more property tax. About 23% just right. 24% say it's too high. More should come from the development fee. And about 7% each uh, of not liking these either or, or not knowing. Next question. So the funding sources, because the development fee will fluctuate, you saw the slides from Laura, it's not, as, it's not as stable over time. It fluctuates each year based on development. It is difficult to know exactly how much it will generate over time. The city estimates that about half of the affordable fund will be collected from development fees and the other half will be collected from property tax. Does this balance between the development fees and the property tax seem about right to you? Is it too much property tax? Is it too much development fee? You don't like either of these sources and prefer a different source? Or we shouldn't be using any source of funds to pay for housing? So I don't know, no opinion. So I think this captures the options from the previous one. However you felt about the fees, you should have a spot to expect. So yeah, how do you feel about this balance? Does this balance strike you about right when you think about who should be paying for the the funding of affordable housing. This is a balance between property tax and development fees. If you think it should be shifted one direction or another, hopefully you see the option that you prefer there. This is just the percentage. So if you wanted more money, you could still have more money, increased rates, but in terms of the balance between the two. 
This is about the kind of percentage coming from each. Hopefully that makes sense. What's that? Great. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, actually that's a great question. So we're, we'll, get a, we'll get to the question about the total amount in a minute. Thanks, Laura. All right, so closing this one in three, two, and one. About 39 say it's too much property tax, 34 say it's about right, 13% say too much development fees, and uh, again, about 6% say they don't like either of these sources, 6% don't know. Next question. So rental housing built with the city funds will be available for families earning less than 80% of the area median income. That's about $64,100 for a family of four. Do you agree, disagree, the income limit should be higher, serving families that make more? Do you disagree, and the income limits should be lower, serving families that make less? Or D, I don't know. So this is kind of where should we focus those funds? If you think that's about the right, up to the 80% of AMI, up to about 64,000, you'd agree with that. If you think we should increase that and support more folks at the, on the income scale, or decrease that and f focus the funds on the lower percentages of the AMI. That's a family, of, yeah, just a, an estimate of a family for income. So it'd be less than that, obviously, for single folks. Great, and we'll close in three, two, and one. So a range there, so about 49% disagree. The income limit should be uh, lower, serving families at the lower end of AMI. About 25% agree, and about 19% disagree that it, that line should be raised and support more folks at the higher levels of AMI. Great. So the city has proposed uh, uh, limiting funds for home ownership, so those dollars from this fund that would go towards home ownership, to 100% of AMI for construction of new housing. That's about $80,000 for a family of four. And 120% of AMI for home ownership assistance, which would be about $96,120 for a family of four. So that's where that threshold is, 100 and 120% of AMI. Do you agree with that? Would be A, do you disagree and think the income limit should be higher, serving more families higher up on the AMI scale? Do you disagree and think the lower, uh, we should focus those funds on the lower AMI scale? Or do you not know and have no opinion? That's a good question. I think that one would be uh, probably in uh, don't know, no opinion. Yeah, of these options. It's good, good feedback. <laughs> yep, it's just improving the, the way we gather input. All right, we'll close this in three, two, and one. So about 17% agree. 60% disagree that the income limit should be lower, serving uh, folks lower on the income scale, and the 12% don't know or no opinion, or that uh, might be including folks that don't think that's the right source. Actually, I guess the way on that one is, whichever way you voted would be how you'd allocate them if those dollars were there. All right, so the fund impact. It's difficult to estimate the exact amount the fund will earn given the fluctuation in development fees from one year to the next. The city estimates that the fund would generate about $155 million over 10 years and would preserve or create 6,000 affordable homes. So that is background. Which best describes your reaction to the size and impact of this fund? Again, I think some folks asked this question about overall dollar amounts earlier. A, we shouldn't be doing this at all. B, we should do something, but this is too much money. C, this amount of funding is just about right. D, this amount is not enough, we should be doing a little more. E, this amount is not, we should be doing much more. F, I don't know. So in that total pot of 155 million over the next 10 years, 6,000 homes, how much is that in your opinion? 
So hopefully one of those options will capture that. <laughs> I'd say that sounds E, probably. <laughs> Press it really hard for E. Yeah, that's All right, we'll close in three, two, and one. So about 61% say this amount is not enough. We should be doing much more. 20% say this amount is not enough. We should be doing a little more. So about 81% in the room feel like that's not enough and we should be doing more. Next question. Okay, this is another one where you have three top priorities. So you get three clicks on this. Choose your top three priorities for spending the new dollars in order of preference. So press your top priority, the first button, second priority, the second button, and the third priority, the third button. Yeah, it does it. The magic of the clickers captures that. It's the order that you press them in. So it just well it just says the number of votes when we aggregate it they're weighted so uh, the question is how do you know uh, the order of your and this is very important so thanks for bringing this up we weight your first press at a higher value the next press is at a lower value and the third press at a slightly lower value so it is important the order that you um press them in so per a permanent housing for homeless with supportive services if needed b low income rental housing for those on disability social security or lo very low wages Workforce rental housing for workers who earn slightly more, but still struggling. D, home ownership for moderate income families. Or E, other not mentioned above. Where would you prioritize it? First click is your top priority. Second click is your second priority. Third click is your third priority. Looks like we just taking a little more time to think about. So we'll close in three, two, and one. So it looks like 33% is it with the weighted averages and low income rental housing for those on disability, social security, or very low wages. Uh, work, worker, workforce rental housing at 28% and 26% permanent housing uh, for the homeless. All right, next question. How supportive do you feel about the proposal's overall balance between property tax and a development fee? Would you say that you're very supportive? A, B, somewhat supportive, C, neutral, no strong opinion, D, not very supportive, or E, not at all supportive or opposed? The overall balance. Yeah, there's about the 50% 50, 50 each, each of them covering about half the total cost. What's your overall feeling about that balance? So while we're closing, I'll just take that. So th what are we gonna do with this information that goes towards city council? It informs the refinement of the proposal. We'll close in three, two, and one. 27% uh, say uh, not very supportive, 25% somewhat supportive. 20% very supportive and 17 neutral or no strong opinion. Okay, next question. Let's see. How supportive do you feel about, okay, this, is, uh, this may not be uh, on the, uh, those of you that are looking at handout questions, this was kind of a re last minute addition. So how supportive do you feel about doubling the property tax to one full mill, an estimated 13 million in year one, and eliminating the development fee? I have some sense of how these uh, answers will come out, but this is just data for the input. Uh, uh, so how supportive do you feel about doubling the property tax to one full mill, an estimated 13 million in a year one, and eliminating the development fee? All options are, this is live polling folks, so your, your feedback matters. Would you be support, very supportive, somewhat supportive, neutral, no strong opinion, not very supportive, or not at all supportive or opposed to that idea? That was a very quick vote, so we'll close in three, two, and one. About 66% not at all supportive or opposed, 15% uh, not very supportive, and 6% across the race. So there are different perspectives on that, some, some representation. Uh, 
Next question. So it is important for the city of Denver to dedicate new local funds to address the challenge of affordable housing. Would you say you strongly agree, agree, somewhat agree, you're neutral, somewhat disagree, disagree or strongly disagree? It is important for the city of Denver to dedicate new local funds to address the challenge of affordable housing. And we'll close in three, two, and one. 80% strongly agree, 12% agree, so 92% strong agreement. 